Lijepo vas pozdravljam i dobrodošli u novu emisiju Glob Zoom Nikole Kneza. Danas vam predstavljam povjesničara i člana Kraljevskog književnog društva, pa čak i engleskog ruskog grofa Nikolaja Tolstoja. Grof Tolstoj je posvetio pola svoga života na istraživanje tragične sudbine kozaka koji su nakon završetka drugog svjetskog rata bili izručeni Rusima. Za nas Hrvate Njegovo istraživanje je zanimljivo jer se sudbina Hrvatske vojske i civila nakon drugog svjetskog rata poisto vječuje sa kozacima. Naime, i jedni i drugi imali su garancije Engleza da će biti prihvaćeni i proslijeđeni do sigurnih američkih zona u Italiji. Umjesto toga, na prijevaru su izručeni jugoslavenskim i ruskim komunistima koji su ih masovno likvidirali. U našem slučaju radi se o najvećoj tragediji hrvatskog naroda, poznatoj kao Blajburška tragedija i Križni put. Grof Tolsto je objavio mnoga literalna dijela. Za nas pak najznačajnije je The Minister and the Massacre. Po objavi njegove knjige tužin je sudu jer je engleskog premijera Harolda Macmillana pointirao kao primarno krivca za izučenje desetaka tisuće ljudi. Iako su svi arhivski dokazi govorili o njegovu korist, sud je odrezao kaznu od 1,5 milijuna funti zbog uznemiravanja službene osobe njezina kraljevstva. Grof Tolstoj i njegov rad je živi primjer kako se istina dijela povijesti još uvijek pomno skriva, jer govori o masovnim zločinima nevenih ljudi, o tajnim suradnjama dviju javno suprostavljenih ideologija kapitalizma i komunizma. Stoga, drago mi je pozdraviti ovog hrabrog čovjeka i grofa istine. Poštovani grofe Tolstoj, vjerujem da bi za naše gledalce bilo zanimljivo znati da li ste vi u rodu sa poznatim ruskim piscem Tolstojem. Yes, I am. In fact, I'm not a direct descendant, but I'm the head of the senior line of Tolstoy family, and so now I am actually the head of the family. As head of the family, I have a wonderful cross, the cross of Saint Spiridon, who is the patron saint of our family, which I think was given to my ancestor in 1430, and we still have it. Recite mi, molim vas, kada je vaša obitelj došla u Englesku? My father Dmitri was born in 1912 uh, and we lived in the, the, the city outside the city of Kazan. Um, but when the Reds finally in the spring of 1920 were preparing to no sorry in 1918 were preparing to seize the city and Trotsky gave orders for all members of the nobility to be massacred. Uh, we we were told that we had to flee and join the whites and um but suddenly my father was told by the the doctor he had very bad illness i forget what and he couldn't be moved so the men of the family my grandfather and the others they went off to join um, admiral kolchak's forces and my father was looked after by his aunt and his english nanny who uh, was they were both very brave and they kept him hiding in the city for two years And finally he was um, escaped from the Soviet Union in 1920. He was smuggled out by his nanny. She pretended he was her illegitimate son and smuggled him out through Finland and so we came to to England. And I was born in England 15 years later. Možete li za naše gledatelje opisati kad ste i zašto počeli istraživati sudbinu kozaka nakon Drugog svjetskog rata? Well, I was always very interested in the Cossacks and in Russian history. Though sometimes English people say, oh, well, you must be biased in favor of the Cossacks because of your ancestry. Well, actually, the Nikolai that I'm named after was 
um, killed by the Cossack leader Pugachev in Catherine the Great's reign. So I don't have any special reason to be biased in their favor. And, um, but my interest developed at an early age. And I think the first time I heard of the sinister history of the repatriation in 1945 was in 1956, um, uh, when as a young man, I heard the Bulgan and Khrushchev were making a state visit to London, the first visit by Soviet leaders. And I was so angry, I went with a big placard, which I held up saying, keep the red beasts out. And I was immediately arrested and put into a police cell. And uh, there a nice police sergeant came to give me some supper. And he asked me why I felt so strongly. And I said, well, I mentioned the repatriation, which I must have heard of. And he said, oh, that's funny, because I was in the British Army in Austria in 1945, and we had to send the Russians back, and we thought they would be happy to go. And he said, but they were committing suicide, and I realized there was something wrong. And this stuck in my mind. But it wasn't until the, uh, the British government started in, I think, um, about 1973, releasing documents from up to the end of the war. And a Ukrainian friend of mine looked into it briefly and he said, hey, you should look, look at these, they're now releasing the state paper. I did go and look, and even though what I saw then was tiny compared with what I know now, and nevertheless, I saw that this was a terrible thing. I didn't know the numbers that something like um, two and a quarter million people were handed over, which is roughly the same statistic for the Atlantic slave trade during um, three centuries. And this is the British and the Americans handed over them to these slaves. Uh, and so I thought, well, I, and nobody else seems to be writing the story and I shall write it. So I, I did, but it took me four or five years of research. But the great advantage of doing the research then was that I was able to interview so many people of all nationalities who were involved. And that gave me a much more vivid and direct picture. But of course, also I relied on the British um, state papers which were released. U vrijeme kad je vaša knjiga izašla van, izazvala je veliku pozornost i čuđenje posebice zbog uloge engleskih snaga u cijeloj priči. Taj dio izrodio i kontroverze. Možete li nam reći o čemu se radilo i kako je knjiga primljena u engleskoj u kojoj živite? Yes, I read the second book after my victims of Yalta because so much new um, information had come to light. And the other very important factor was that I had not realized that the Serbs and Slovenes and Croats were being handed, well, I knew they were being handed over, uh, but it occurred to me that this was also a secret of World War II, and that maybe if I learned more about that, then I would learn more about the Cossacks. But before long, I realized both stories are equally important. So half the book is about the Croats and Slovenes, and the other half about the Cossacks. And I pointed to Harold Macmillan, who at the time was um, the British minister in the Mediterranean, the political advisor to Field Marshal Alexander. And uh, there, I couldn't go into all the evidence here in this interview, but the uh, documentary evidence is overwhelming that Macmillan secretly gave the order, first of all, to hand over the Cossacks by force if necessary. And secondly, and even more sinister, to hand over thousands of people who were not Soviet citizens. And the Yalta Agreement, which the British government still says, oh, well, they were just obeying the Yalta Agreement. Well, that's just not true. The Yalta Agreement very carefully says only Soviet citizens should be returned. So this made me realize that there was a conspiracy within a conspiracy. And uh, now I finished another book uh, that perhaps will come to. <music>
Kozaka, otkrili ste podatke da su Englezi isto tako izručili Titovim partizanima Hrvate i Slovence. Yes, I, re- I realized that this was a story that um, hadn't been told, the, the Yugoslav side of things, not hardly at all, and uh, so I investigated both. And again, I was lucky to interview a number of Croat, Croats, Serbs and Slovenes who were victims of these awful occasions and this, the book came out in I think ni- 1986 um, and in 1990 a, a moment Slovenia broke away from uh, Yugoslav dictatorship I came to um, for the first time to Slovenia and there I went to, I was taken secretly to the place uh, in Kaczewski Rog where there so thousands of people were murdered and the bones were still there of course then that was I think about the, from memory 50,000 people were handed over by the British to be murdered by Tito. Yeah, And no yeah, British government has awesome. ever expressed regret for this. Dalije Macmillan odluku o izručenju donio sam ili u koncertu sa Churchillom. But I, I think I share in my book and that Churchill did not know and was deceived by Macmillan. Uh, who didn't tell him what was happening. And indeed, as I say in my recent book, that the, the, all the military men involved said it was a political decision. And the only politician involved was Macmillan, who flew into Austria uh, in, um, on the 13th of May, 1945, and there gave the order that uh, these people were all to be handed over uh, by force if necessary and as far as the cossacks were concerned he specifically says cossacks and white russians and this was never never authorized and was kept secret from churchill and secret from field marshal alexander the commander too so it's still a mystery wow. but you 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 mentioned what is macmillan's motive well there's no question in my mind and i think anyone who sees the new evidence will i think agree There's no question that he was secretly given an order by Churchill. On the contrary, Churchill, uh, and this is one of the new major factors which has come out in my new book, is that arrangements were made by Churchill, uh, arranged with Eisenhower for the Cossacks to be evacuated from Austria into the American zone and, uh, and should not be handed over to the Soviets. So there was actually an alternative. People... At the moment don't realize that, but that is the fact. Čitajući vašu knjigu, našao sam zanimljiv podatak o kretanju Macmillana na samom završetku rata, odnosno u svibnju 1945. godine. Letio je iz Londona do film maršala Aleksandara u Italiju, potom na Blajburku, Austriju, i za toga u Rim. Da li znate sa kim je imao sastanak u Rimu i o čemu se razgovaralo? I could, I never found any but he, I think he met the pope he, yes he met the pope um but he, I don't think anything particularly significant happened there I would say more significant was his relationship with the um Soviet delegation at allied headquarters in Naples and he they were of course they were not diplomats they were well they were called themselves diplomats they were members of smirsh and their principal job was to ensure the handover of every russian living in the in who escaped into western europe one way or another 
And um, I suppose if I guess, I mean, this is a guess, but uh, I think you, you have to, uh, as Sherlock Holmes said, when you've eliminated the alternatives, then you're left with the truth. Well, the alternatives are not very gr great. Yeah. There was no pragmatic reason for doing it. Uh, we didn't gain anything from it. So there was some other reason. Um, but as I say in my new, my new book, if those were good reasons, why didn't Macmillan himself advance them? He was alive when my two books came out, but he wouldn't say anything. And he knew that sooner or later, if he told a lie, he would be caught out. So he said nothing. Vi ste imali pristup engleskim vojnim arhivima pri istraživanju podataka za svoju knjigu. U jednom se trenutku odlučilo taj arhiv zatvoriti. Kako je to utjecalo na vaš istraživački rad? Um, I don't think there's been any um, general closing of archives, um, but in specifically, yes, what you said is, is correct, because after my book came out, um, I was then sued for libel by the, the British Chief of Staff in Austria, who signed the orders, and I said he was no, no different from a Nazi war criminal, and I certainly would still say that. And he, um, so he then was compelled to sue me for libel, and uh, immediately the whole British establishment Dirty Tricks Brigade went to work, and among um, their dirty tricks was that they removed all the compromising documents from the public record office where people like myself can consult them and removed them and hid them back at the foreign office and the ministry of defense for the whole duration of the trial <coughs> and how we found out about this well first of all when i wanted an R a record i was told no is the foreign office has it we could do nothing about it and so most of the defense case became impossible as a result and it's ironical that when eventually in 19 i think 1992 i went to russia uh, by, uh, as i'll explain later um, to look at the russian archives they were far more open than the british far more to je jako zanimljiv podatak Pokušavam razumjeti kako mi u Hrvatskoj još uvijek nemamo otvoreni ulaz u arhivu iz vremena komunističke diktature jugoslavenskog režima. Because after all um, Croatia is not that I'm much of admiration for the European Union but it claims to be an open democratic society and that they can conceal historical evidence like this is the first mark of a totalitarian government. They have to control the past in order to control the present. Znači, skrivanje dokumenata, a time istine, postaje jedna od glavnih poluga njihove moći. Well, of course, it speaks for itself. They wouldn't, well, they wouldn't hide the documents if they didn't show the Tito's regime in a very sinister light. Uh, in the same way, why did they hide the documents that I wished to see? Because it showed that what I'd written was fundamentally correct. And indeed, the documents they hid would have greatly strengthened my argument. I don't say that through guesswork because subsequently I was able to get copies after all when it was too late for the trial. So I think all one can do is continue to press to make sure that the rest of the world knows about this and sooner or later, I mean I never dreamt before 1990 that one day I would be invited by President Yeltsin to come to Russia and see all the secret archives. So if it can happen there, I think it can also uh, happen in Zagreb. We hope. Of course, yeah. in their guilt, they may destroy the documents, but that in itself will be an admission of guilt. Arhiva komunističke Jugoslavije je uglavnom u Srbiji i nama je nemoguće do nje doći što znači od Hrvata se skriva povijest jugoslavenskog režima. Što mislite da li bi Englezi mogli stisnuti Srbe da ovi vrate našu arhivu? Maybe if one day we have a civilized government in Belgrade, then we will see the archives, we hope. They can't destroy everything as I found because after all in my case it was a miracle to me that, that I found the other half of the documents in the um, in Moscow. And of course the British government couldn't get access to that.
donio odluku osudi svih zločinačkih režima u koji je konačno uključio i komunizam. Što mislite, može li ta odluka potaknuti vlade država, organizacije za ljudska prava, akademiju i pojedince u većoj angažiranosti oko istraživanja komunističkih zločina? Well, everything in, in that recognizing these obvious facts is, is for the good, of course. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the, the sad thing is that here in Britain, and that from what you say also in Croatia, uh, that they don't really equate them at all. For instance, our Prime Minister went to um, uh, commemorate the liberation of Belson. Uh, well, it was a very good thing that we did say, but we were actually, um, we, we hadn't murdered anyone in Belson. It was the Nazis who did that. But there was no apology for sending back one in, in his in our Britain's case, well over a million people to be sent to the gulag or machine gunned on arrival. And there's no, no so the official position in Britain is tacitly that communism is nothing like as bad. But as you say, anyone who's familiar with the facts knows that there's, particularly between Nazism and communism, very little difference. Josip Broz Tito, Stalinov adjutant, je zauzeo deseto mjesto na rang listi svjetskih masovnih ubojica svih vremena. Što mislite o Tito? Well, I think uh, Tito, of course, had worked in the Comintern for Stalin, and uh, he had been trained up by Stalin, and practically all his comrades were betrayed by him in Moscow and liquidated. And Tito survived as, as Stalin's pupil, and he realized, and I wouldn't be surprised if he hadn't received direct advice, just the only safe way with your enemies is to kill them all. And if you kill too many, well, that's better than killing too few. So they go for these huge figures. Of course, it, it doesn't necessarily work in the long run, because these horrific figures are what part of what impresses itself on public consciousness. I mean, like when um, Jewish people commemorate the seven million Jews who were slaughtered, the figure, in one sense, it shouldn't be important. If one Jew was murdered, that's a, 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 an atrocious crime. But actually, you're multiplying the crime by one, 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 until you get to seven million, or in case 750,000 in Croatia, in, in Russia, we still don't know, but far more than were killed by Hitler. Uh, and in China, even worse. Um, the, all these, these communist, and, um, or socialist rather, uh, totalitarian regimes have far more in common than they have different. It doesn't stop them quarreling with each other because just as the, the mafia falls out with its own people. Krenemo li od Europe, uključivo Njemačke, Jugoslavije, Rusije, pa sve do Kine, uglavnom su najveći masovni zločini počinjeni od strane socijalista i komunista. Da li je uopće moguće takve masovne likvidacije ljudi napraviti bez unaprijed pripremljenog i razređenog plana? Znam da bi moje pitanje moglo otvoriti Pandorinu kutiju, no zanima me što vi mislite, postoji li neki globalni zločinački mastermind koji planira sve te zločine i zločince? Well, I think the mindset of the dictators, of course, is that they just have one thing, that a, a, dead, a dead enemy is a better than a live one, and they've no, they've no religion, of course, they're all atheist regimes, so they have no conscience, and uh, they have this uh, crude Marxism, which is a, provides their equivalent of a spiritual justification, but in fact all it does is justify any crime of any sort. But I think psychologically, um, People do need a justification, and even the worst criminals, if you talk to them, well, I can't say I've talked to many, but um, they have uh, evolved a sort of justification that they were badly treated in their childhood, or the police were corrupt, or uh, this sort of thing. And um, uh, I remember when I went to um, um, Belgrade I, uh, in 19... Uh, about 1990, yes. Um, I interviewed, I've forgotten, I've forgotten his name momentarily, the awful man who was Tito's chief henchman in arranging the killings in Slovenia. And um, I interviewed him, and to my embarrassment, I, I, some nice um, Serbian journalists had arranged for me to meet him. We were in the open in a cafe of a summer, and he embraced me, and he said, I'm now 
given up communism and I've become Russian Orthodox Christian. And I thought, some Christian. Uh, but of course, he, fundamentally, all he needed was something to justify his crimes. And um, Stalin, Hitler, and I think Mussolini was uh, not a good man, but he was on a slightly different range, I think. I don't think, I think fascism is, in some respects, distinct. Um, uh, similar, the similarities are great, but also there are distinctions as Hitler uh, himself recognized. And it's interesting that I think I'm right that I read somewhere that when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, up to the, then, the um, National Socialism was the respectable name that the Nazis gave themselves. And Stalin gave the order, they will now be known as German fascists. But they were never called that before. And now you hear even people in the West have now swallowed Stalin's propaganda without even knowing they're doing it. Uh, because it was not Nazism. Uh, um, uh, Nazism was not really fascist. It was, it was socialist. It wanted rule from above, people who know what's best for the population. The population can have no say in what happens. You have a small party of the elite which in fact is completely subservient to the dictator. And of course, today, the biggest nation on earth is ruled by just such a genocidal, sinister regime. So unfortunately, the evil has not been rooted out and it will only be rooted out, well, in different ways, but above by being strong, and but also by being making people aware of the truth of the nature of these regimes. Prema ovome što kažete, prepostavljam da ste se sastali sa komunističkim zločincem Srbinom Simom Dubajčem, Titovim partizanom. Prema našim podacima, on je osobno ubio vlastitim rukama preko 2000 Hrvata. Što mislite o njemu? Well, I would say he was a, a low criminal type to me. He was a, extremely friendly to me, a little bit too friendly, I thought. And he... Um, uh, But he did say something, he said to me, uh, I've got, and I got a tape recorded interview. He said, you must understand I was a, a communist in those days. And if Tito had told me to murder my grandmother, I would have done it willingly. So that tells me everything about communism. The people who now uh, justify or in any way assist the propagation of the idea that communist rule was not bloodstained up to the elbows, um, they, are, in one respect, are, are worse because they don't have to um, accept. Um, Dubaish was a fairly uneducated man operating in a totalitarian system. Uh, these people are, are, are free. They don't have to express these opinions, yet they, they choose to do so. So in that major respect, I find them more evil, even than someone like Dubaish. But yes, he was an evil man, but yeah. I think every criminal Uh, to, uh, totalitarian society will find these semi-criminal elements and make good use of them. I uza sve navedeno, vlade Hrvatske, Bosne i Hercegovine te Srbije još uvijek zataškavaju i sakrivaju komunističke zločine i zločince koji su ih naredili, odnosno izvršili. Što mislite zašto? Yes, it's shocking to me, really shocking. After all, in some respects it's the, the truth is more evident in the former Yugoslavia because you can actually see these mass graves which so far we've not been able to see inside um, the Soviet Union uh, whereas there people can see with their own eyes so they I think they deceive themselves and but uh, mostly they're I guess opportunists um, people with no obviously by definition with no principles at all and uh, but they hang on to power because it's what they love. And uh, then they also, in all these regimes, um, not enough, I think, is made of the material advantages of holding this position of power, which they deny to others. I mean, they, Tito lived, he had palaces all over Yugoslavia. Um, he, he had his mistresses. He was, um, Stalin had, he could draw any amount of money he liked out of any bank in the whole of Russia. He lived in incredible <coughs> style. Even Lenin, whom they supposedly was more puritanical, he wasn't at all. He was at the height of the initial famine in the early 20s. He stopped grain, some grain deliveries so that several Rolls Royces could be delivered from England for his personal use. So I think one shouldn't 
overlook what is probably the strongest element, which is the, this criminal, criminal mentality. As criminals, they have no shame in lying. <laughs> There will be big pressure in England not to publish, I know that. Um, but to me, it's a very exciting book because I've now, for the first time, I've got the, all these records from the, so the Soviet archives. And in my previous book, um, I think in The Victims of Yalta, I wrote at one point, of course, I have to confess that there I've done as much research as I can, one half of the information is not unknown to me, and that's in the Soviet archives, and perhaps it will never be known to me. But now it is known to me, and I have the copies of the archives, and they're absolutely devastating for the British official position. And they show without question the conspiratorial nature of what, of, of what happened. At every, every detail is now vouched for in the Soviet archives. And I've been told, but I don't know if that's true, that these archives have been closed since I went, which was, after all, nearly 20 years ago. Um, I don't know if that's true, and it may not be. But nevertheless, of course, I take very good care that I have many copies in many places. Um, but I'm much more afraid of the British government than the Soviet government for interference. Basta me iznenadili ovom izjevom. Zašto tako mislite? Well, the, the, the British are sly. They will, um, the government, I mean, the British people, but uh, the British government. And you'd think that today, none of them obviously had any direct concern with what happened in 1945. Many of them weren't even born. But nevertheless, they feel that what I write threatens their position. That they're, um, but they must feel very vulnerable because a sensible, humane person um, is prepared to accept the, um, things, but they can't accept it. They, they have to, they feel their privileged position is, to some extent, involves a ridiculous feeling you have got to be seen to be perfect. But we're none of us perfect. Hoće li u vašoj novoj knjizi biti riječi i o Hrvatima i njihovoj sudbini križnog puta pod jugoslavenskim komunističkim režimom? I can't say that I've discovered such extraordinary new evidence in the case of the um, Croatian. I have got material evidence, which I refer to. For instance, I was able to not only to interview Simo Dubajic, uh, but also Dr. Franz uh, Kocheva, who was the um, Yugoslav which... communist uh, colonel, who actually made the secret deal with 
um, British um, Brigadier Lowe, the one who took the legal action against me. Uh, and he, I have about two, two hours of him telling me exactly what happened at this meeting and what was going on there. So there are still things I will hope to publish. Vjerujem da ste čuli odluci Austrijskog parlamenta kojom žele zabraniti održavanje Blajburške komemoracije. Kako bi čovjek mogao opisati tu nemoralnu i primitivnu odluku koja je protiv svih pozitivnih normi civiliziranog zapadnog svijeta? I myself experienced this and I forget it in the 1980s when I went to one new, I went several years to the Bleiburg to the commemorations in May and on one occasion I was there and um, afterwards there was a British uh, reporter from the Times who wanted to interview me and we went to his hotel and um, the police came in and said you're not allowed to hold this interview and the, uh, the writer from the Times was amazed he said but I thought this was a democracy and policemen said no you can't you can't report this so it's not very different now from what i hear and i don't know why but now i'm mystified then of course the austrians are probably a little bit frightened of tite there were still uh, tank blocks and so on along the frontier of barbwa but now they're not going to be invaded by anyone so i can't understand what's made them behave in such a despicable way which it is and after all the people most of the people at Bleiburg were murdered once they'd crossed back into Yugoslavia but many were killed on the spots and these crimes should not be whitewashed out if they were doing it if it was about a, a crimes committed by Nazis in Austria against Jews of course they would they wouldn't dare to ban the meeting but what's the difference they're all human beings Poštovani Grofe Tolstoy Hvala vam najljepše na vašim zanimljivim mislima koje ste podijelili sa nama. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Dragi gledalci, Posjetite web stranicu Hrvatskog finskog instituta na kojoj možete vidjeti par odličnih filmova, pročitati osvrte autora, odnosno i akademske radove relevantne po temama za našu hrvatsku povijest, kulturu i naciju. Sljedeća emisija bit će sa Inom Vukić, našom poznatom Hrvaticom iz Australije. Lijepo vas pozdravljam, želim svaki uspjeh i svako dobro. Vidimo se uskoro. Thank you.